Holy sh**. Miniature Landscape Hobbies is proudly supported by these sponsors. Gale Force 9's new game, Clash of Steel, is just hitting the shelves of your friendly local game store now. And it's gathering quite a bit of attention. This is rightfully so, because it's simply awesome. But any astute observer or miniature wargamer with previous experience with Gale Force 9 and Battlefront Miniatures other offerings will notice that Clash of Steel is, at its core, pretty familiar. When you crack open a Clash of Steel starter set, in my case the British vs. Germans box, you see the really cool super heavy and prototype tanks that are the stars of the system. These are not just incredible models, but they also promise to be fun to play and paint. But under the promise of these new models, it's possible to see that the rules governing how the system works are essentially the same as the tried and tested mechanics that are featured in Flames of War and Team Yankee. Because of this, you would be forgiven if you asked, why does Clash of Steel even exist? In this video, I'm going to review Clash of Steel and pay particular attention to the mechanics and story behind this exciting new game. The reason for this video is to provide a deep dive into the intent behind the system and highlight for experienced or curious wargamers just what sets Clash of Steel apart from its other 15mm scale gaming relatives. So with all that out of the way, let's get to it. Miniature Landscape Hobbies is committed to bringing its viewers the best in miniature building content. I would really appreciate it if you would consider helping the channel in one of two ways. The first way is to leave a one-time donation by making a super thanks comment. The other is by considering joining our Patreon. Our Patreon community is growing all the time and it offers tons of perks. Thanks for your time and now back to the episode. As most viewers will know, the parent company to Battlefront Miniatures is Gale Force 9, and GF9 has the license to produce the World of Tanks miniature game. This game is totally different from Flames of War and Team Yankee, and has little to no commonality in terms of rules. The models, however, being 15mm tanks, are common across all three games. This makes for a really cool synergy where the demand for the three different games can to produce one common set of models. For World of Tanks players, this is a particular advantage. World of Tanks, as far as I know, does not have any lore or historical component to honor, so prototype, rare, or theoretical vehicles can be featured to add variety and interest. But herein lies the issue. Flames of War, and admittedly to a much lesser extent, Team Yankee, are nominally historical games. The idea of injecting weapons that are pretty much fantasy into timelines that are founded on fact does not sit well with a lot of historical wargamers. Now, from the outside looking in, this might seem very nitpicky. But you must remember that not all miniature gamers are historians, but all historical wargamers are. So, while some players might embrace the odd and rare vehicles in their games, the idea is contentious enough that a great number of players will ignore these cool vehicles on principle. Though I'm not such a purist on this matter, I can certainly respect this point of view. But what if the history that limits the existence of these armored behemoths was reimagined, with a gentle nudge of reality that is largely based in historical fact, a world could be justified that allows these fantastic models to be used by both players of the historically inclined or anything goes philosophies. And so Gale Force 9 has done just this with Clash of Steel. Looking at my Clash of Steel set, I found the alternate history detailed in both the German and British forces books. 
The broad premise is that von Stauffenberg's assassination attempt on Hitler in July 1944 was successful. This led to an early end to World War II, with Germany surrendering in December 1944. The division of Soviet and Western Allied spheres of influence, as well as the reconstruction of post-war Germany, then puts the U.S., British, and their immediate allies at odds with the Soviets. Eventually, this leads to a Soviet attack on the West and what remains of Germany in 1948. And boom, you have the backdrop for Clash of Steel. But I hear you ask, what about the game mechanics? Well, Clash of Steel itself is essentially the same as Flames of War. When I read the rules, it took all of a few minutes to go through them, because I know the mechanics from years of playing Flames of War 4th edition. The movement, including movement orders, shooting, and morale rules are all identical. The only difference is there is no mention of artillery, infantry, planes, and no assault step. Because it's just tank on tank, machine guns are absent too. Strangely, the gone to ground rule has been replaced by the camouflage rule, but the effect is the same. Army selection is also similar to Flames of War. You select platoons of tanks as core options and can add support as you see fit. The forces book for the respective countries detail this and provide all the options. Speaking of options, the variety of vehicles you can get is on the smallish side, though I'm sure this will expand as new kits come out in the future. You can see a limited number of familiar World War II style units such as the Cromwell and the 75mm Panther in the books. But here you'll also find a variety of vehicles such as the 88mm Panther and the Tortoise, tanks that didn't really exist or barely existed, but would be logical steps forward if the war started up again shortly after 1944. All the vehicles have unit cards that are very Flames of War in style, just formatted a little differently. And no, the points costs aren't the same, sorry. One thing that players of Flames of War will be happy to find out is that the core sets have unit cards for more vehicles than just what comes in the box. This means that you can use at least part of your existing Flames of War collection to play not having to buy new boxes of models you already have just to get a few cards is a good thing. I tip my hat to Gale Force 9 and Battlefront for doing this. It's clear they want to engage the player base rather than attempt a cash grab, which is a refreshing change from what seems to be the norm these days with a certain other miniature company. A minor change that you'll notice regarding force building is that there are a number of commander abilities you can spend points on for upgrading your HQ tanks. These are all neat additions that are pretty generic, and more or less work like command cards in Flames of War. Clash of Steel has something called tactics cards. At the start of the game, each player is dealt three, and you draw a new one with each turn. These offer minor events or upgrades which have temporary effects to help turn the table to your advantage. Biding your time to figure out when to play these cards could be crucial and adds a new layer of decision making to the game which isn't present in Flames of War or Team Yankee. Now we come to my favorite part of Clash of Steel. At least my favorite part that's not about super heavy tanks. That is, the missions. Clash of Steel doesn't have fixed scenarios like other Battlefront games. Instead, it relies on the random draw of three types of card. You draw these in order to create your games. First is the mission setup card. This shows the deployment zone, objective locations, and the basic layout of the tabletop. Second, you draw a mission instruction card 
which defines how many turns the game lasts, and any special rules like reserves or ambushes that'll take place. If you're curious about the special rules, they're all the same as those in Flames of War. Lastly, the third set of cards are the objective cards. You draw one for each objective in the game and place these face down on each objective token. You do not look at these until the start of the turn that corresponds to the number of the objective, this being turns one, two, or three. Because of this, it's possible that certain in-game changes may not happen until the objective cards are flipped. The nature of these cards varies a lot. Some objectives may be decoys and not count towards the game results. Some might create obscured visibility, and others might change the number of victory points the objective is worth or impede movement. This element where the missions themselves can change during the turn sequence is really exciting and probably what will set Clash of Steel apart from other miniature games. Though the dice roll mechanics, and even some of the units involved, will be the same as they are for Flames of War, the sheer variety of missions, and the randomness introduced by the tactics cards should create a significantly different feel than you get with Battlefront's other games. Flames of War and Team Yankee play in a very top-down way, where once the game begins, the major degrees of uncertainty a player faces are based on the actions of your opponent and the luck of your dice roll. Clash of Steel ups the ante on this by making what you'd often consider a fixed element of the game, such as the location of objectives, dynamic. As such, I think that players will find the gaming experience less calculated and more of a mad dash, where you have to think of ways to avoid unpredictable occurrences caused by not just your opponents, but by the battlefield itself. So there you have it, my whirlwind tour of Clash of Steel. As far as new games go, I'm very excited to dive in. So this brings me back to my original question. Should Clash of Steel exist? The answer, in my opinion, is yes. Ultimately, the point of miniature gaming is to have fun, and I can't see anyone who participates in this game not having a riot while playing it. That in itself warrants going out and starting a Clash of Steel force. And this doesn't even begin to touch on the gorgeous models or the fact that that it gives you a chance to command really big tanks. Really big tanks. If you'd like to learn more about painting 15mm tanks, please watch this video, or consider watching this other video instead. Thanks for watching, please like, subscribe, and post your comments. And as always, remember to keep building life in miniature.